I'm delighted to be here um, sharing this um, forum with you and with Dr. Leonard and Dr. Furman. So the topic that I'll talk today is sequencing monotherapy versus combination therapy. And I forgot to put my disclosure slides, but essentially I do receive um, research funding and I have received um, honoraria from all the companies that are doing these novel agents because I've been involved in this, in this research. And I will be discussing some off-label use of these drugs, mainly ibrutinib, pidelalizib, and venetoclax, but it also includes duvelizib and other novel agents. So let's talk about, you know, why sequencing and how is that important? Well, so you really truly want to have the best therapy frontline for your patient. Um, that's the first thing. You want the best bang for your buck, right? So you give the best therapy, best overall response rate, base time in remission, hopefully so that your patient doesn't need a second line therapy because the time between therapies tends to shorten and the response rate also tends to go lower. So, but let's start. With CLL diagnosis, you have a patient that is asymptomatic. As of today, 2019, we still don't treat the patient. There are currently ongoing trials in Germany to see if a high-risk patient that is asymptomatic would benefit from a drug such as ibrutinib. But as of today, we still don't treat. Now, there are four important questions that you need to address. One, is the patient symptomatic? And we just said, you know, if it's asymptomatic, no therapy. Presence of 17P. That will guide you. That's very important. You have to test for 17P by FISH and TP53 by um, Sanger sequencing. And the reason for that is because these patients, historically, we know that they don't respond to chemoimmunotherapy approaches. And if they were to be treated with that, you are shortening their um, survival with chemoimmunotherapy because they have a very unstable chromosome that can lead to more uh, progression or a more aggressive disease. So these patients need to be treated with a TKI. Right now, the currently approved drug is ibrutinib. Next line is IGHV mutational status. Many times we don't test it. At our center, we do test it because that's where we started doing the testing for this. And the reason for this is because two things. If you have a mutated IGHV, these patients are going to be um, living with a disease that is less aggressive than unmutated IGHV. Not only there's a chance that they may never read um, need therapy if they have a mutated IGHV, but also if they get treated with FCR, there is a chance that you can cure them with 10-year overall um, progression-free survival still in remission after 10 years, as you just saw with um, the data that Dr. Foreman presented. And last but not least is fitness. So this leads to the real important thing. First of all, always consider a clinical trial. So. Um, we have new clinical trials, and I will talk about it, and I will um, encourage all of you to um, have your patients uh, participate in our trials, particularly if they have the 17P deletion or um, TP53 mutation. Now, if this is not present, you do test for mutation and analysis, and if they are mutated, you have to de determine based on the patient whether the patient is fit or unfit. And um, as of the NCCN guidelines, the latest uh, revision, it's telling you that category number one is ibrutinib. But I still think that FCR or BR have a role, and there are some patients that may tell you, I don't really want to be on a drug forever, or they may not be able to afford ibrutinib. So these patients with mutated IGHB could potentially receive FCR or BR. Um, for patients unfit, as of right now, the combination regimen that is um, approved is obinutuzumab with chlorambucil, but I um, ask you to please um, hear the news that are going to come out of ASCO on the CLL14 trial that is going to be presented by the Germans. This is venetoclax in combination with obinutuzumab, um, which use, is used in the same uh, patient. It's only one year regimen, and we will all hear about the, the outcomes. This is currently being reviewed by the FDA as a novel regimen for frontline therapy. And now when you have unmutated disease, also based on fitness, but as of right now, ibrutinib would be your first choice. So in terms of sequencing, you have patients that already had the first therapy, right? And they stop responding for any reason. What do you do and what's the optimal sequence? Unfortunately, as of today, we don't have data that can answer that question. So let's start from the beginning. Anthony Mato and colleagues um, had a retrospective study of 178 patients. This was 10 different centers, a hodgepodge of different trials. And what he found was that the majority of patients stopped taking these drugs because of toxicity, number one. 
Second is CLL progression. And third, and very, very minimal amount is patients that do have a risk of transformation, which was one of the concerns at the beginning when these TKIs were being um, tried and tested or in clinical development. But truly, there's no higher risk for Richter transformation. Mainly, your patients will stop taking the drug because of tolerability issues. Now, the outcomes of alternative therapy after discontinuation of ibrutinib or idelalicid, he did See, what happens with the patients when you stop taking ibrutinib and you use idelalisib, if you use idelalisib and then follow up with ibrutinib, or if you stop any of these drugs and use BCL2 inhibitor like venetoclax or chemoimmunotherapy. And what he found in this initial retrospective analysis, and you know, we have to take this with a grain of salt, is that chemoimmunotherapy really didn't work. But remember, all these patients had been refractory and relapsed after chemoimmunotherapy. So it's difficult to understand how it would be in a patient that has never been exposed to chemoimmunotherapy. Nevertheless, venetoclax seemed to be the drug that seemed to have the best outcomes once you stop responding to either ibrutinib or idelalisib. And the most important thing is that in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival, the people that did the best, that's the red line, those are the people that stopped the drugs because of intolerability and not because of progression or Richter's transformation. So he followed this study with a longer cohort of patients, this time about 700 patients. And he found that the patients treated with ibrutinib or idelalisib as first kinase inhibitor had a significantly better PFS in all settings. And um, this next line therapy that was a TKI was better outcomes compared to chemoimmunotherapy. So, and, um, the graph on the top, on the left, it's a PFS by kinase inhibitor in the frontline setting, meaning that the patients that got ibrutinib at the beginning had a longer PFS that was not reached compared to the patients in the red line that had been exposed or treated with idelalisib. Now, remember, in the United States, we don't traditionally use or suggest or recommend to use idelalisib as a first-line agent because of what happened in the clinical trials where there was severe toxicities. However, in Europe, this is approved, and patients can still receive idelalisib as a frontline when they have high risk disease and are unable to tolerate any other therapy. And in terms of PFS by relapse refractory disease, also the median PFS by pe people treated with um, ibrutinib was 36 months, and for patients treated with idelalisib was 11 months. So he, again, pulled up why did people stop the drugs, and essentially the most common reason was toxicity. And I'm sure all of you have had a patient that has developed a toxicity. The most important thing to remember when using a drug such as ibrutinib, which is a very clearly very powerful drug, is to try to work with your patient because the first year is when you have more of the side effects and toxicities that may lead to discontinuations, including atrial fibrillation. So we always try, we stop the drug, and then we reintroduce the drug maybe at a lower dose and see if the patients can tolerate because we really don't want to um, not use a BTK inhibitor. So in terms of response to subsequent therapy, again, in this larger cohort, we start to see that venetoclax seems to be the winner, right? But this is all retrospective. And it wasn't until we got true prospective data that we could really see if this was real or not. Um, in terms of optimal sequencing, as you can see, the, the light blue line on top is patients treated with venetoclax, again, the clear winner, and the biggest loser is the chemoimmunotherapy um, that you know, was given to the patients, and that's the um, orange line below, as you can see that there. So let's talk about toxicity and why do we have to um, try to keep our patients on BTK inhibitor. So, most of the patients will have some toxicity at pain rate in severity. The first three months or four months, most patients have diarrhea, fatigue, usually GI um, symptoms, but they get better over time. This is thought to be related to um, off-target effects of ibrutinib. So if you were to create a novel agent that actually targets the same pathway but has less off-target effects, could we see anything better? Um, and that's when acalabrutinib comes along. So it's not currently approved for use in CLL patients, but NCCN guidelines state that you can use it in patients with ibrutinib intolerance. So um, your insurance will be able to cover you know, for, for acalabrutinib in these patients. 
So this was a subset analysis um, of patients enrolled in a phase one, two trial, 33 patients. 73% of the patients remain on treatment after a median of 9.5 months. And these were patients that were intolerant to ibrutinib. So this is a potential option for your patients if you still want to use an ibrutinib inhibitor. The only caveat and most important message is that if you have a patient that has a BTK mutation or has progressed on ibrutinib, a calabrutinib will not work. So always, if you have a tolerability issue, you can use a calabrutinib, but if you have a progression, on ibrutinib, that doesn't work. So if that works in relapse refractory disease, how about in frontline? So um, these are the data that was presented last year at ASH. The best overall response rate in 99%, 99 patients was 97%, with very few patients achieving complete remission, only 5%. But this is the PFS. It's ridiculous. You know, <laughs> We didn't believe it, and, and the EFS is very similar. So um, it's, it seems to be a very good drug, but you always need phase three data, right? Because um, phase two or phase ones are usually selected patients. So right now, there's a phase three ongoing trial. The trial has um, stopped accrual, and we're just waiting for the mature data to come out. This is in high-risk disease. So now let's talk about uh, PI3K delta inhibition. Rituximab with plus or minus italalisib led to the approval in the United States of the drug um, italalisib, the first PI3K delta inhibitor based on the um, response rate of 84%, all partial remissions, and a PFS of 19 months, including in patients with 17P deletion. Now, the drug unfortunately has um, toxicities that are autoimmune complications, including colitis, pneumonitis, um, <coughs> severe infections, transaminitis, and that's the reason why um, the drug is not um, that much used currently. But recently, we got Duvelisib approval, and this was based um, on the phase three trial comparing the drug against sofatumumab. The overall response rate was 74%, with 70% of the patients with a 17P deletion achieving a response. Um, very few complete remissions, only 0.6%. And the median PFS was 13 months, but actually, if you had two or prior therapies, the median PFS was longer, at 16 months. The issue with Duvelisib is that it has the same toxicity profile, it seems to be. There has never been a head-to-head -head comparison, but just looking at the data, if you see the ones in the circle, um, diarrhea and colitis are very high in grade three, grade four, which means that the patients need to go to the hospital. So is the end of PI3K inhibition? Um, there's a new drug called Umbralisib, and this was recently published in the Lancet Oncology in 2018. Uh, where in the phase one trial, at patients that were getting the drug at target dosing of 800 milligrams once daily, the patients with CLL had a response rate of 85% with a median PFS of 24 months. So this drug is currently in clinical trials and in phase three trials. The drug not only has activity in CLL, it also has activity in follicular lymphoma and in um, DLVCL. So there are currently some um, trials um, doing it in combination for Richter transformation with the thought that it might have some activity. There was also a phase two um, intolerance trial where you used umbralisib after you had developed a ibrutinib or adralisib um, toxicity that made you no longer be able to take the drug. And this is the initial trial. We are hoping to present a longer follow-up on this study at EHA this year. So now let's talk about venetoclax. Remember that I was telling you that it seemed to be the winner on patients that had stopped taking ibrutinib or adalalisib. Venetoclax monotherapy um, was tried and tested in patients post ibrutinib or um, adalalisib. They had to have a relapse. On the arm A is patients that received ibrutinib or post ibrutinib. Arm B are patients that received idalalisib. And what you see here is the overall response rate by IRC was 70% for patients that were previously treated with ibrutinib and 62% for patients treated with idalalisib previously. So not only do you get a response, some patients also had a little bit of um, complete remissions. And um, importantly, the responses were durable. Most um, interesting and promising was that some of these patients achieved MRD-negative disease or MRD-undetectable disease in the peripheral blood, and one patient was able to achieve MRD-negative state in the bone marrow. So the problem with these drugs is that they eventually, you are you know, selecting for different clones, and you're taking a drug daily, so this can put you at risk for mutations. 
And for the BTK inhibitor, we are now seeing that there's a BTK mutation and a PLC gamma mutation. This was published in the New England Journal in 2014 with the first six patients that developed either one or, the, or both. And BCL2 inhibitor can develop a mutation, and this was recently presented at ASH as a late breaking abstract. So this is one of my patients that was on um, ibrutinib on Resonate trial and recently developed a progression um, just seen by uh, thrombocytopenia, and I tested him with a clinical laboratory, and he ended up having a, both a BTK and a PLC gamma mutation, along with other markers of high-risk disease. So why do we try to do combinations? So we are trying to improve the efficacy, get deeper responses, and maybe avoid the development of resistant clones. We can maybe, if we achieve MRD and detectable disease, provide time-limited therapy and minimize the toxicity. So we start talking about the Murano trial. This is a phase three trial that led to the approval of venetoclax in combination with rituximab. This was um, tested in patients with relapse disease, VR against BR, or vendamacin and rituximab. This trial included patients with 17P deletion. And what we're seeing here is that there was a dramatic difference in outcomes in patients achieving undetectable MRD of more than 49%. And the patients that achieved undetectable MRD had a very long progression-free survival that was not achieved. And so these are the first data to demonstrate the value of undetectable MRD as a predictor of improved outcomes with a fixed duration chemo-free regimen. So this regimen is only given for two months, for two years. Now, if we have venetoclax working with rituximab, how, what do we do with um, you know, the other novel agent, ibrutinib? This was a study presented by Peter Hillman from the UK where it's called the CLARITY in relapse refractory um, trials, ibrutinib with venetoclax. 47 patients treated, 90, 94, um, 50 patients treated, 94% of them achieved a response, and 54% of them are in complete remission in 12 months. Importantly, many of them are able to achieve an undetectable MRD in the peripheral blood and the bone marrow. If we do that combination in frontline, uh, Bill Weirda also presented the study Captivate, overall response rate 100%, including patients with 17P deletion, and many of the patients were able to achieve undetectable MRD. So these are promising regimens. Um, but that's not the only thing in the um, clinical development. The Germans, um, they love their bendamastine, and so they did a clinical trial of benda, initially for the bulking for two cycles, followed by a combination of a monoclonal antibody with a TKI. And um, as you can see, really good response rates, but again, people start to think, why do you need chemotherapy when you are looking so good with only chemotherapy-free regimens? So that brings us to CLL14 trial. That's the trial that I told you that we should be presented at ASCO. Overall response rate in 12 patients treated in the leading trial was um, 100%. 58% of them achieved complete remission. The PFS rate at 30 months was 80% with an overall survival of 92%. The press release in October 2018 said that the trial had achieved um, its endpoint. And there was a press release uh, last month saying that it's currently being evaluated by the FDA. So we're all eager to hear about this trial. And this may change the way that we treat our patients in the future, because it's only given for one year. Now, if two things work well, what about three? So this is triple therapy. Um, this was presented by the Ohio State Group. Overall response rate, 96%, and MRD negative. Um, Achievement was seen in 58% of the patients. So this is the basis for the next Alliance and ECOC trials that is going to, and is being started in quarter one of 2019 in patients with untreated CLL. Young patients or um, elderly will have the same data. So briefly, in the last couple of minutes, I want to mention the role of CAR-T therapy. This is the study transcend CLL004 in relapse refractory CLL patients treated with ibrutinib. So 100% of these patients, so there were 16 patients, had prior ibrutinib use, and 50% of the patients had been actually refractory or relapse after ibrutinib and venetoclax. So these are the worst of the worst, right? These are the patients that are going to die really quickly. Overall response rate, 81%, with a CR rate of 44%. 
with undetectable MRD by flow cytometry in 73% of the patients. This is the best data that I have seen you know, on these highly um, risky patients. The issue is the toxicity. All of them had a serious adverse event. However, um, it's not as bad as it used to be in the past. Um, the rate of um, cytokine release syndrome in uh, grade three or higher was only 6%, and neurological events was only um, 18% in grade three or four. And there were no fatalities, which is new from some of the other CAR-T data that we have seen. So high response rates, high achievement of undetectable MRD, and um, after analysis of dose escalation, um, this study is moving forward with a larger phase two trial in the first half of this year. So in summary, um, optimal management has to be tailored. There's no one size fits all for our CLL patients. We still don't have enough data to know which one is best. Once venetoclax is approved for frontline, what is going to be the best for our patients? There's currently no head-to-head -head studies. Duration and compliance has to be taken into account. The cost for the patients has to be taken into account. And what will be the future role of chemoimmunotherapy when none of these patients are going to be seeing chemotherapy? So with that, I um, appreciate your time and um, thank you for your attention. <laughs>